Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Social Hard and Roundtable. Oh, uh, it's going to mute there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the mm -hmm. Social Housing and Roundtable, uh, a very special event put on on a Friday afternoon in collaboration with the CIH who are sponsoring today's event. So thank you very much to them for helping put this uh, put this together. Um, to those who I've not met, haven't spoken with, um, the Social Housing and Roundtable is an event that I run every single week, usually on a Tuesday between 11 and 12. Uh, this is actually our 108th Social Housing Roundtable. All of them are, have been free. All of them are available online. Um, you can catch the recordings from the last 50 something on uh, Spotify, Amazon and YouTube. And we've discussed anything and everything in the sector. And that's always been the aim is I don't mind if you're a housing assistant with two weeks experience or a chief exec with 40. This is a place where you come together voices can be shared in a way that sometimes isn't always easy to do at conferences and we can all have a shared and authentic view um so the one thing i will say is it doesn't matter whether you disagree with someone's opinion let's just please be respectful as we go on because i can see today's topic being a bit contentious in some areas uh i'll quickly introduce myself before introducing uh our, our keynote speakers today so as i say my name's matt baird i've been working in social oh someone's just not on mute I've been working in social housing recruitment now for the last 11 years. I set up on my own three years ago with the idea of trying to do things a bit differently. Um, a, recruit a bit more ethically, maybe sometimes than you get in a standard recruitment agency. And it's, as it's just me, myself and I, I kind of hold myself to account with that. But also to try and do more for the sector. I'm one of those things that I've done. So I've become co-chair of the board at Spring Housing in Birmingham. But I've also set up this, this weekly event, which now has over 800 members that that you know come together every single week so it's fantastic to see so many new faces within the community uh finally as a last favor before i pass over this is kept free because of my recruitment business so my favor to you will always be if you are a recruitment or if you're involved as a hiring manager in any way shape or form please reach out to me have a conversation and my promise to you then will be that this will always stay free and open to everybody in the in the social housing world so without further ado i'm going to pass over to sarah and james to start today's session on a very contentious topic that I will absolutely say just as we start, please be aware that this isn't a CIH initiative. This is very much a government initiative that CIH are helping me lead on in terms of the consultation and everything going on with it. And if you have follow-up questions, myself and the CIH are here to, to follow up and support in any way we can. So Sarah, I'll pass over to you to introduce, we'll go to James and then we'll start today's presentation. So thank you, Sarah, for coming today. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Matt, and thank you for inviting us. It's lovely to see so many people here, but uh, I know it's going to be one of these conversations that's going to continue and we'll only be able to scratch the surface in an hour. So um, I'll ask James to introduce himself first and then I will talk to you a bit of the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really good to be with you today. Uh, I'm James Prestwich, uh, Director of Policy and External Affairs at CIH. Um, so in a way, I think we were, we were billed as a double act, and we absolutely are a double act, uh, but probably we'll, the, the, the key part, I think, for, for us, for Sarah and I uh, today is the, the conversation, uh, the Q&A, I think really a conversation that will follow from the, uh, from the opening remarks that I make and the, and the pretty short presentation that Sarah will give you. We're, as you know, uh, deep into the consultation phase for um, the competency and conduct standard. So effectively, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of key things I think that, that we can get out of today, hopefully help um, in terms of uh, people's uh, understanding. Um, we're conscious that people are busy doing the day job. For some of you, you will be absolutely across the detail of all of this. For others, uh, you're probably just coming to it. Uh, so hopefully there's a, a big part of today, which is about let's, let's all get to a point where our understanding is where we need it to be. Uh, and then the real benefit for, for Sarah and I is the opportunity to hear from, from you all as uh, as housing professionals. I'm not sure we may even have some tenants on the call, I, I don't know, but to hear from you uh, as we start to craft and think about CIH's response to the to the consultation. So a little bit of background, first of all, how, how did we get here? I mean, we CIH, the, the professional body for uh, for housing and, and I always make this point whenever I talk about this subject um, I, be I believe that the social housing sector is a, a professional sector uh, we see fantastic examples of it 
um, day after day. You know, I get out and see uh, uh, see what our members do in their day job, and I'm frequently blown away by the the expertise, the skill, the compassion, and the professionalism of people working uh, working in this sector. Uh, that said, there is always room for for improvement, um, and we don't, as a sector, come into this into this process. Uh, with our reputation where I think we would like it to to be, and it's really important I think to to reflect on that as we think about how we we respond to to this agenda, um, and how we ensure that professionalism and a greater focus on professionalism is, is at very much the heart of what we do. Um, you know that the, the background is uh, is is tragic uh, in in as much as the you know the the greater the greater focus of government attention on professionalism in the social housing sector came off the back of the appalling tragedy at Grenfell some some eight and a half nine nearly nine years ago I think now uh, in that intervening time period uh, I think it's legitimate to, to ask questions where the government could have moved faster but we've had the uh, social housing regulation act um, and the competency and conduct standard and the focus on professionalism I see that as very much complementary to the work and the agenda and the government's agenda on the on the regulatory side of things, which is how can we look to try and drive improvements in the tenant landlord relationship to ensure that the people that live in social housing are treated with the uh, with the respect uh, that they deserve, that they have access to good quality services, and that the culture in the organisations that serve people that live in social housing is absolutely where it where it needs to be so off the back of that and, and, and hopefully this isn't a surprise to anyone you know the government has been very clear Michael Gove in particular that he sees and they see uh, embracing mandatory qualifications as being a key part of of this agenda uh, with that you know and with that in mind with that at the forefront of all of our minds uh, government launched the consultation on the competency and conduct standard uh, a couple of weeks ago it's an eight-week consultation um, and the consultation uh, period is up on the on the 2nd of april so where we are at the moment is we are deep into the the detail absorbing what's in the government consultation deciding what we think looks like it works really well deciding what some of the areas are that we think we need further clarification and and, um, and we are in the process of refining and crafting uh, our response to to that consultation as many of you and the organizations you work for will also be doing so today as i said at the start it's a really good opportunity for us to expand that conversation and help with our with our consultation so so that's it for me in terms of the the introduction uh, I'll pass across to, to sarah now and then after that we'll have the opportunity for that wider conversation brilliant thanks very much james so yeah, so we, what I wanted to do is just spend a few minutes looking at some of the detail in the consultation um, so that we're, we're clear about what the government are, are proposing. Um, as James has said, we, are, we will be pulling together a response to DLUC on this and, and the conversation here will inform that. Um, I've also included at the end of the um, slides a link to a survey that we've also got so that members can access. So please, um, I would urge you to, um, to contribute in that way as well and provide an individual response from your organisations because the more feedback we can get on this, the better. So I am Director of Professional Development at CIH, looking after all of our education provisions. So obviously this, this sits kind of front and centre of my area of responsibility. So, um, we have got the consultation. It's an eight-week response time, as James has said. Um, the consultation focuses on our direction to the, the social housing regulator and um, applies to all staff involved in the provision of management services. So uh, private registered providers and local authorities. And one of the first things that did identify is that, is that each organisation has to have a regularly updated written policy. Um, on the development, management and development of skills and knowledge and experience of staff. And that should relate to the individual staff within the organisation. It also should relate to service providers, relevant staff. And this is an area that I think um, there will be lots of questions around, um, but organisations need to be clear that um, any service providers who have staff that are specifically focused on housing management may also come into scope for this legislation. Um, and it should also cover the learning and development review staff performance um, aspects of, of the organisation as well. Um, as 
part of that, the other the other um, requirement within there, or the suggested requirement, is uh, an appropriate code of conduct that is specific to the organisation that everybody adheres to. So one of the key requirements within all of this is um, for staff to hold a qualification. So this applies specifically to senior housing managers and senior executives of registered providers and also, as I said before, service providers. Um, I think we need some more clarification really around exactly what that relates to, but it's quite specifically not frontline staffing service providers, it's, it's senior managers. And it's those that have got a substantive role in managing delivery of housing management services. And that's going to vary across organisations, going to be different people in different organisations. Hence, I think why it's been um, phrased in this way. Very specifically, um, the people that aren't in scope are those that are identified there. So your unpaid volunteers, people who, who are back office functions, specifically relating to things like finance, I think, or HR. Um, or a direct delivery and care and support. So for level for senior housing managers, it's a level four housing management qualification. And for senior housing executives, um, it's a level five qualification. The qualification has got to be a regulated qualification on the National Qualifications Register, um, or it can be a degree through a recognised university. And it must be focused on housing management. So, and delivery of housing management in a social housing environment, not in other aspects or other areas of the sector. So the sort of functions that are in scope, as I say, it's going to vary across different organisations. So there's going to be some work to do. And I know a lot of organisations are looking at this already um, to determine who those senior housing managers are um, it's going to be those that are, di are involved in direct delivery of housing management services, and those are some of the examples that are in the consultation document of the types of roles that could be within scope. So this is at level four. I will send these, we will send these slides around afterwards, so please don't feel like you've got to write everything down. It's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. For senior housing executives, so this is at level five, um, that is normally going to be heads of service or directors who provide that strategic direction, again, very specifically around housing management services. And there are some examples there of the sort of aspects of, the, of a role that might make it eligible or necessary for this requirement. And depending on how organisations are structured um, and the size of organisations, then in some cases that might be the CEO as well as um, directors, senior managers within those organisations. The consultation also includes um, criteria around the sort of qualifications that are going to be acceptable. Um, what, the, what hasn't happened is that, a, um, is that there's a list of specific qualifications, which I have to say I'm very happy about because it would be very, very difficult to keep that up to date and make sure that it was um, complete. Um, so what has been included instead is a set of criteria. So for senior housing managers at level four, um, those are the sort of areas that are expected to be included within, within the qualification. So CIH has housing qualifications at the moment, which cover many of these areas. We are reviewing that to make sure that obviously those qualifications will cover all of these. Um, but there might be qualifications from other organisations of the bodies, previous qualifications that people hold that could also be relevant. And then um, at level five there, again, for the senior housing executive, um, again, there's a breakdown there of the, of the types of areas that need to be covered by the qualification. Um, this could also apply to university degrees that people have achieved and previous qualifications that people have achieved. Um, the other area that's covered by the consultation is the transition period for this. Um, so, and it's, it seems that government have, have tried to sort of give some time for this to be implemented, but not too much time in that momentum is lost. Um, basically, but this is an area that I would urge you to look at 
very carefully in terms of um, providing response and feedback. So at the moment, with, they're proposing a two year transition period um, within which, or by the end of which, people will either need to have achieved or be working towards the relevant qualification. Um, in earlier conversations that I was having with Dean, look, they were talking about people having to having achieved the qualification within that two year transition period. I think there's a there has been some consideration of um, capacity and impact on organisations. So that has now come through as being within that period. You have to be you have to be um, working towards the qualification. There's an expectation that 50 percent of eligible staff are enrolled halfway through the transition period with everybody else being enrolled um, within the full, within the two years. <clears throat> There's some recognition for extremely small organisations um, that then that, that might be a challenge in terms of um, accommodating numbers of staff have doing a qualification alongside their day job. So um, for there, there's a proposal that should be double the transition period. And um, there is some specific transitional arrangements for people that have maybe completed an apprenticeship without qualification element. I've, at the moment, the housing apprenticeships do have the qualification within them. So I think in most cases, people have well have completed a qualification if they've done the housing apprenticeship. But in some cases, it might not be the case. Um, and also, if you've got qualifications that cover partial some of those criteria that I just talked about, but not necessarily everything. Um, there's also recognition, I think, that quite a lot of people in the sector will hold qualifications from bodies like RICS. Um, and there's um, there's a um, something in there to say that um, that might be possible to do top up modules in relation to that. And then after the transition period, so as no sort of business as usual um, circumstances, then the expectation is that staff would be enrolled on qualification within six months of starting a job or nine months if they've got probation period at the beginning of that. Um, and once they're enrolled, they should commence their course within six months. So this is to kind of recognise you might not get on a course like within two days of, of wanting to apply. Um, and also the fact that whether when start dates are available, because courses will start and at particular start dates, it's not they're not going to be available every day of the week, every year, or across the year. So, um, so there is a, an accommodation there for that. And then um, again, there's not a time limit set by um, government or proposing to be set by government in terms of how long it should take you to complete the qualification or something to complete the qualification, um, but. Under normal circumstances, if you enrol for a qualification, then that time frame will be specified at the outset. You know, if you did a degree, you know, it's going to be, I don't know, 12 months, two years. If you do a vocational qualification, um, it's likely to be sort of 12 months, 18 months. So there will be time limits set by the qualification providers, I think, around that. Um, if there wasn't, then you would there would basically be a, a requirement to, con to complete it within two years. And then there's some flexibility around sick leave, maternity leave, and all of these things, as you would hope. Um, and if, the, if there's a prerequisite to, um, to complete a lower level qualification first, um, I think the thing to, to confirm in relation to CIH qualifications is you don't have, if you haven't got a qualification at all, you don't have to do level two, level three, then level four, then level five. You can go straight in and do the level that you need to do. So. Um, but there might be for the qualifications coming to the market, then there might be those prerequisites in place. So for CIH members, we've produced a what you need to know document and there's a link within the slides here to that, which gives a bit more detail. Um, but there's probably no getting around the fact some, some of us will have to read and have already read the 300 pages or whatever it is of the consultation document. Um, and as I say, we also have a, a member survey. So for those of you that are members, we'd really encourage you to um, to um, to go through that survey as well, as well as providing feedback um, on obviously on behalf of your own organisations. So I'm really aware that's an absolute whistle stop tour of a really complicated area with lots of detail, um, but hopefully it gives you a sort of high level 
understanding of the sort of focus of the consultation document and the key areas that uh, that are included within there. Thank you. No, thank you, and thank you as well, James, for for like I say, it is very much a whistle stop tour. Um, but there's already a lot of questions coming up in the chat. So uh, just from here, I will say to everyone, the, the 100 people in the room. So if you have something you'd like to bring in, either feel free to put it in the chat if you don't want to be brought to the table. If you're comfortable and you're willing to do so, please use the reactions tab at the bottom of your page. Raise hand gesture. We'd love to bring you in and hear from you. Just some initial points in the chat while we're waiting for uh, anybody who'd like to dive in and, and bring their point to the table. So um as the CIH qualification is mandatory for relevant staff, will the CIH certificate become part of the apprenticeship standard and therefore the certificate costs part of the levy payment instead of a separate commercial cost? Nice, easy one for you to start with. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, that's without getting into too much detail then. Um, the qualification is a part of the apprenticeship framework at the moment. Um, Funding is applicable to an apprenticeship. You can't do the qualification separately and get apprenticeship funding for it. You can only get funding for the whole program. So you, you would have to do the whole apprenticeship program with a qualification as part of that in order to get that funding. Fantastic. Uh, Jason had said, how much is substantive? Uh, uh, sorry, substantive. I think that was based on your first slide, which I'm just trying to remember the top of my head. Which, yeah, which I think that's about the role, isn't it? Yes, um, it is, yes. Yeah. I, Jason, I think that's going to vary um, from organisation to organisation. Um, but I think it's a good question to to send back to um, to D-Look. Um, I would, I, at the outset of this, I would say we, we've got some answers to some questions, but there's lots of questions that we won't have answers to, but we will capture them all and, and feed them back as well. Thank you very much. Just before I bring Angela in, there are two points here that kind of tie in. So we'll do this and then I'll bring Angela in. So Yurik had asked, would it be, will it be left to organisations to decide if the CEO is in scope? And Stephen had said, we've had some discussions internally about the roles in scope, particularly the exec. Our SMT is made up of some roles you would assume wouldn't be, but collectively they're involved in the decision making around housing management. We've included all members of SMT when looking at estimated costs. And I know this is an area that's going to potentially cause some conflict moving forward. Um, is uh, is it the CIH's understanding at the moment that it's left to organisations to decide if all, it, who and who isn't is in scope? It is, yeah. It's. I think the way that we're seeing it is that it's this is about. Um, there's there's a number of things within there, aren't there? There's this, there's the thing around professionalising or increasing the professionalism of the sector more broadly. So there is a, an expectation that the focus will be on senior managers and senior leaders in this at this stage, but also that that would filter across the rest of the organisation. So I'd really urge organisations to be looking across the board in terms of staff development and career development frameworks, opportunities, which doesn't necessarily have to be qualifications. It could be ongoing training, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> but I think that the way that I see it, might be the world according to me, is that an organisation would be expected to pull together the evidence to show how, how they've identified organize the, the, the particular staff that fit within this particular requirement and also what activities they have in place to help develop professionalisation across the rest of the organisation. So and from a common sense point of view, it feels to me there's got to be some opportunity for, for a conversation between the organisation and the regulator about the reasons why particular roles have been identified and why other roles might not have been. James, I can see you in the chat there. Do please come in. Yeah, yeah. Just going to say, I think the, 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 the point on this that we're always keen to stress when we engage with um, with ministers and, uh, and, and officials is about the differences that we have within the sector. So I think, you know, if you if you come to the sector without uh, any any great knowledge or understanding, then you, you, know, you might have a view that once you get in the front door of any organisation, whether they're 130,000 home or a, or a 200 home organisation, that they broadly look the same and people's jobs are broadly the same. And um, that isn't always the case. So, you know, on the on the exec team or SMT point, there will undoubtedly be some organisations, uh, particularly on the smaller side of things, where you have a very, very hands-on chief exec that is involved in, in a heck of a lot of operational housing and asset management. 
Um, and it may well be the case that, that they very much in scope there, but we know that that differs from organisation to organisation. And that's incumbent on us through that ongoing engagement with government, but also through the consultation response to be really clear about the differences that we get with, you know, the, the, that's what makes the sector what it is, isn't it? That the organisations are very different and work in, in, in very different ways. Of course, there are similarities, but it's really important to make that point and we will continue to do that. Fantastic. Uh, Angela, I, I know you quickly turned your camera off. I just want to see if you're still here to maybe bring your point in. Can you? Oh, wonderful. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, I, I asked the first question that you raised there, Matt. Um, I just want to re-clarify on something um, as I, I'm in, in charge of the levy uh, payments for our my organisation that I work for. Um, and with the courses that we currently do for C uh, the CIH, housing and property management level three, level four, um, we have to pay an extra commercial fee for the CIH certification, which doesn't actually, um, it, 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 there's a bit, of, a bit of conflict with what's being said already that you have to do, I understand you've got to do the whole course. We have to pay an extra fee for those CIH modules and the certificate alongside the apprenticeship and that is a commercial cost to my company. Yeah, so as it's as it's now going to be mandatory, will they, are the government, do you know, and CIH looking to absorb that within the um, CI, uh, the housing and property management um, apprenticeship? Yes, apologies. Sandra, that was probably a confused a confusing answer from that point of view. Um, there, as far as we are aware, and we've talked to the government about funding of this quite on a number of occasions, there are no um, plans to change any of the funding mechanisms at the moment. As far Thank as you. Know. Thanks for clarif clarifying that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Angela. Um, great. Like I said, anybody else who'd like to dive in, feel free. So a uh, couple of the next points, again, were related. Victoria had said, can I get some clarity on the definition of qualifications? Most people refer to them as CIH qualifications. Suzanne interpreting roles in scope uh, on the face of it consultation appears to suggest that senior managers in property and asset teams uh, would have level four or level five will CIH offer a RICS top up and I know this is all something you're looking at at the moment from a CIH perspective but in terms of that that clarity that seems to be one of the main the main concerns around the uh, around the consultation is this something you're saying to people this is our understanding but we urge you to write back to gain more or, or where, where do you kind of sit in terms of, for example, a RICS top up? OK, so in terms Matt, of... Shall I... go, go on, sir. No, go on, sir. You, you, you go first. Now. Perhaps I can chip in on that asset management and property point as well. Yeah, so in terms of the qualification point, it's housing management qualifications. It's not CIH qualifications. So if other organisations wanted to offer, like City and Guilds or whatever, wanted to develop a housing management qualification, then they absolutely can do that and it would be valid. So as long as it meets those criteria that I mentioned. So <clears throat> I think at the moment we're in, we, CIH qualifications are the only game in town on the, at this level. So that's probably why they're referred to in that way. Um, yeah, in terms of the roles in scope, then there's, there is that aspect around service providers. So as well as housing organisations and um, housing associations and local authorities, there is an aspect for service providers that if they have, if there are senior managers in those service providers um, relating to asset uh, um, repairs and, and, and planning and stuff, then they would be eligible and would be required to hold the qualification. It specifically does say it doesn't relate to frontline staff that doesn't relate to those people going into the properties to com to complete the repairs but i'll pass on to james because he's there's more about this than me yeah no well i was, I was just going to say uh, it you know you've, um, you've asked asked for views on it and, and yes i think i think my view would be would be strange were senior managers in property and assets teams not not included as part of this it's really important i know absolutely you know this isn't where you were going with the question but but i think it's really important that we as a sector acknowledge that you know, we're property businesses, but we're people businesses as well. So, you know, when I started working in housing 20 years ago, it did feel as though there was a split. You know, housing management did people, asset management did property. You know, that's, but we know that's not how it works. So, you know, if we've got senior asset management uh, uh, pro professionals, they have to be able to um, buy into, understand the kind of ethos that we should have in the social housing sector and the way that we treat, you know, the people that live in. 
uh, that live in social housing. We know when we look at uh, uh, you know on ombudsman caseload. We know when we look at complaints within organisations. The majority of complaints, uh, the point, the key point of tension in the landlord tenant relationship is around repairs and maintenance. So you know it seems to me very very obvious that that those senior roles should be in scope fundamentally the vast majority of people who live in social housing want, want you know their priority number one is to make sure their home is is in good order and that repairs are carried out in a in a decent way um quickly so it's no surprise for me that they those positions would be would be in scope fantastic thank you i'm going to do one more point from the chat and then i'm going to bring in suzanne and michelle so a uh, point from the chat paul had mentioned the cih direct final route to the cihcm was marketed by the CIH as a level seven postgrad. What will its value under the new criteria be? That's probably a very specific question that I probably can't answer at the moment. What I would say is that um, the, there are we have routes to chartered membership. We either a level five qualification or an experience route to chartered membership. I'm not sure if that's what that's referring to, but that is not a qualification. So we're we're absolutely clear that if you have, or somebody has undergone a, um, the experiential route to chartered membership for CIH, then that won't be applicable, but it is the qualification that's applicable. Um, just going back to, the, sorry, the previous point that I didn't cover around the top up qualifications, we, now that we've seen the content of the consultation and the criteria, and we, we only saw that at the same time as everybody else when it came out, we are looking at other options from a qualification point of view that we might be able to offer in terms of um, those people that have got lots and lots of previous experience but no qualifications. I've, I'll, I can only say at the moment that we started to look at that. I have no um, indication yet of what anything that might come out or that might look like, but certainly it's something that we're looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, Suzanne Brown, do come in. Hi, yeah, I was just going to come back on James's point, really, since I asked the initial question around asset management and property colleagues and some of the challenges that that might actually create for us because um, I absolutely get and would entirely agree with James that we want our asset management and property colleagues to be very focused on people, that we are a people business as much as a property business. Um, but is it in an environment where actually recruiting senior property and asset colleagues is already a challenge um, in an environment where actually those are the colleagues that have a number of choices about the environment in which they work and often, you know, often do choose to move across to the to the to private sector is requiring them to undertake a housing qualification on top going to put us in a position of you know, struggling even further to recruit into those senior asset and property roles. James, feel free to dive in on that one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Take the point, and and I guess that fits into into wider, uh, you know, wider issue about how the how the sector markets itself in an increasingly um, challenging uh, and competitive competitive jobs market. Uh, yes, it does add a clearly would add another layer of complexity. I, I you know. I suppose the optimistic way of looking at that is how, how we can use uh, quals and the focus on professionalism as a selling point for people to join the sector. So there will always be the risk that people will, particularly in the asset management space, will, will, will move to go and work elsewhere. And we know to a degree it can be quite cyclical, don't we? So when you know when the economy is booming and, and you know, private uh, house builders and, and, and firms are, are doing well, it may well be that we lose we lose staff, and that sometimes tips on its head when. Uh, when times are, are harder, I, I, I think, and this probably is a challenge for us at CIH, but the sector more widely, I, I think we've got a really compelling story to tell about why this is a really good sector to work in, uh, not just in terms of the challenge, you know, the challenging work that we're, we're able to do, the, but, but the really rewarding work that we're able to do, but the kind of package, that, you know, as employers that we're able to offer people looking to, to work in the sector. So, Yes, there's a risk here. Of course, there is that, that people say it's not for me. Um, but I, I think if we can use it in the right way, we can paint a, a, a really good picture of why this is a sector that we should look to. People should look to come and work in. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. I'm going to bring you in, then I'm going to go to the chat, and then I'm going to bring in Debbie. So, Michelle, over to you. Hi, thanks, Matt. Yeah, I know there's a lot to contend with here in the now and in the near future, but um, I know what policies are like once they've written. What's the thoughts around um, how quickly the, the sector changes 
and the code of conduct how are you going to make sure that people are abiding by that that they are updating their knowledge and their skills as the sector changes how is that going to be monitored in the future for five years once this is all in place well the the, the um the regulator will have a standard around this, Michelle, so it will be part of their, their auditing process, is what we understand. Um, and I think, um, I mean, there's, it does link into a question around, okay, qualification is a starting point and you need to have CPD activities to, to update and ensure that's happening. But that's part, I think that's part of kind of linked into what I was saying earlier about organisations having that sort of staff development, career development framework in place. So that there are routes that that people can go through to develop and keep their knowledge up to date. But over overall, our understanding is that this is this consultate with this um, consultation is around what the direction to the regulator should look like to monitor that going forward. I think a lot of this is we're very much at the beginning of the journey. I can see a number of points in the chat, which I'm going to go to at the beginning, comparing it to NHS, other services. And I do completely agree on the CPD side. Um, for what it's worth, Settle Group used the social housing roundtable as part of its CPD. So thank you to the Settle Group. But I think one of, the, one of the key things is that this is very much the start of that journey. But if we, if we just let it be the start, it's a struggle. Obviously, the CIH here presenting on the consultation today, and I'm, I'm very grateful to them for it. But it's that what happens next as well seems to be as big a concern for people in the sector as as, as the start point. So it, it's going to be an interesting few years. Um, just before I come to Debbie, so Nick had mentioned he was slightly surprised there's not a requirement for any registration process, something akin to a fit for practice, like in social care or NHS. I think that will probably develop over time. I think at the beginning, we're just trying to get started. I think Craig's point around whether you've reached out to RICS and CIOB to discuss top up has already been brought up. I think it's something that's ongoing. Um, I had a message sent privately, which was that stigma was included in the new conduct and competency standard in draft from DLUC and in the Better Social Housing Review and Action Plan. Um, they'd like to come in, actually, I'll bring them in in just a moment. Sorry, I didn't read the rest of the message. I'll come back to that one in just a second. Uh, and Debbie said it was 50% in the consultation. So on that, uh, Debbie, I'll bring you in, and then I'm going to bring in uh, Yvonne. So Debbie, over to you first. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I guess what I think, I think obviously the focus of this is on the mandatory qualification, but I think let's not miss, there's a, there's two parts to this. There's one that's mandatory qualifications. One's a broader and competency standard that's relevant to all staff. Um, so while the mandatory quals are important, I think there's a bigger thing for organisations to think about is how are they going to raise competency and conduct and attitudes and behaviours across all of their staff, no matter what. And I guess my question to you, Sarah, and you might preempt this question from me is, are you going to be looking at the CH professional standards? Are you going to be updating them? How are you going to link them through to those expectations? Yes. Well, uh, yes. I mean, we have been looking at professionalism more broadly, as you as you know, Debbie. Um, and sort of because qualifications are a part of that, but it's much broader. And it's, you know, in terms of the way we would sort of describe or define professionalism it's around um it's around those code of conduct and ethics and working appropriately in your organization it's around the qualification having the right knowledge and skills it's also about having the right behaviors and values which our professional standards do focus on it's around cpd to make sure that you're keeping up to date and it's around that broader understanding of the sector and where you sit within the sector and what the direction of travel is for the sector so all of those things really um constitute or, or underpin professionalism so you know those are the sort of areas that we'd be expecting um and there's a, that's the kind of conversation i've been having with organizations when they've been looking at this is is to have those pillars in place um <clears throat> excuse me to be able to support that and support developing professionalism in their staff so we will um we are now, as I say, now we've got the criteria, we're reviewing the qualifications, but the other part of that now is to review the, the professional standards as well and make sure that there are, from a CIH point of view and um, becoming a CIH member, I mean, it would be great from our point of view if that was kind of shorthand for professionalism. So that's kind of the, the where we would work towards that. And just in terms of Nick's point that he raises about um, 
a sort of your registration process. Nick, if you wanted to feed back to do look that CIH membership would be a really good way of doing that, then that would be great. Painful. Fantastic. Uh, I was actually about to mention uh, Helen's point next in the chat, but she's got a hand up. So Helen, over to you. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, so mine's coming down to perhaps a little bit more of a granular level. So over the summer, we were doing a little bit of legwork around who's got what in the organisation so that we can start to prepare for this. And we were finding that some qualifications are even before the Institute was chartered, people don't know what modules they've done. So how are we going to find out kind of where those gaps are and how can we overlay it? Have you got any pointers for us on that, Sarah? Well, we certainly will be providing um, syllabuses for any qualifications that sit within the criteria of um, the consultation and that we have available so people can refer to those So um, on our website. So that's part of it. There are always going to be gaps. And I have to say, this is not just about CIH qualifications. It's you know, lots of people have done degree programmes in the past with individual universities. It would be, you know, it's those institutions would hold that information. So it's not, there's not an easy answer to that one, Helen, I'm afraid. But certainly for what we've got available for CIH qualifications, then we'll make that available so people can do that check themselves. Okay, thank you. And on the sort of RICS front, will that extend to CIOB, BTECs, HNCs? Will it be the whole lot up to a certain level, do you know? Or is it going to be that some people might need to duplicate that? Because then we're looking at double CPD. I, I think there's a lot of housing is transforming, isn't it? So there's a lot of stuff going on. I know us at Grand Union, we've got lots of culture change work. And it's it's how it comes back to Debbie's point as well. How can we bring this all in? Qualifications just seems to be a really small element on top of everything that everybody's doing at the moment. And we want to get it right, but it's about how can we build those foundations to make sure we do get it right? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, yeah, in terms of people like Rick's and CIOB, I think they will be looking at their qualifications and looking at top-up modules for for their members or for people that have achieved those qualifications already it's i can't emphasize enough that, that, that this is a huge challenge because qualifications are owned by different organizations so there's not a central place where you would be able to find information about individual qualifications you would have to go to the individual bodies so for BTEC qualifications you'd have to go to Pearson for universities you'd go to the individual university for CIH you'd come to us but yeah it's it is, um, it, yeah, unfortunately, then that's not all held centrally. Okay, thank you. That seems to answer actually a number of the questions that are coming up in the chat around top-ups, around who's working with who, and, and evidently this is going to be a, a big piece that's working together. Um, I know we just answered Debbie's question, privacy. So, you know, I, th I think Nikki has said, where does the responsibility sit to create the top-up modules? Do you see this as the role of the CIH? And I think that's going to be a really difficult one to ascertain over the next few years well as i say that's some that's something we're looking at now because now now that we are aware now that we know what's in the consultation and the sort of direction of travel then that's certainly something we would be looking at for our qualifications if it's necessary um and for those that have got um lots of experience and maybe don't have a qualification but as i say we're at really early stages with that because we've only just been able to have a look at it um but yeah, there's 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 a role there. There, the, you know, these things will come through because there's a there's a you know there's a it needs there's to. A <laughs> but it's also a commercial opportunity, you know, for organisations like RICS or whatever. So you know, I'm, they're going to be looking at that those sort of aspects. Two different questions now that have come in that are slightly different, maybe where we've been before, which is great. So firstly, from Victoria. Given everyone is on starting blocks and staff are keen to understand implications, what do you recommend housing associations can practically do at present? So I would say do a skills audit, do a qualifications audit of your staff to see who's got what and um, and what's then gonna, where the gaps are and what's going to be required. I think that's what a number of organisations I've been speaking to have started to do. Um, so I think that's the starting point. If you've got people that you have identified who are definitely in scope, 
um, regardless of, you know, the, the, the consultation might change some things a little bit, but fundamentally, I think we're probably pretty clear on what the requirements are. You've got people in scale and start to look at enrolling them for qualifications. Those qualifications are available at the moment. James, over to you. And, and what I was going to say, yeah, yeah, this is this is an obvious point, and, and is it so? Sorry, James, your microphone's got really, uh, really jittery. Can't hear you very well. All right. A little bit Can you hear me all right now or not? It's still very dark at the moment. <laughs> uh, right, I'll, I'll leave it for a little bit then. All right, no worries. We'll try and bring you back in shortly. Um, uh, do we know if there is going to be, and I know this is something both Sarah James and I uh, spoke to a number of people about before, do we know if they're going to be looking at recognition of prior learning for those colleagues with heaps of experience but no qualifications? I know this has come up a number of times around people who've been in the sector for many years and going, why would I get qualified now? I haven't been before. Um, you know, th this doesn't seem fair to me. So there's no getting away from the fact that the, the legislation specifies a qualification. So that is it that that is non non-negotiable as far as I can see. Um there are processes for qualifications where if people have got relevant experience, they can bring that forward and maybe get some exemption, credit, whatever you want to call it, towards a qualification. That will be different for every individual person. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to, I think it's going to be very difficult to manage that more broadly across the qualification provider sector. Um, so I think what we what we need to be focusing on really is those kind of top up aspects or alter or you know qualification routes that might that might help with people that have got their experience already sorry that's really really vague but i think we have to accept that the qualification is the requirement and if you don't have the qualification then you are going to have to do something that means you get a qualification at the end of it and qualifications are regulated products with quite a lot of rules and regulations around them so yeah i think there there will be that that there will be some support, I think, in some ways for some experience, but it we can't get away from the fact that that qualification is written loud and proud on the front of the legislation. It is. James. Do I still sound like a Dalek? No, you're fine. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, so, so what I was, what, yeah, following on from, from what Sarah said, we can't get away from the fact that there will be some people, I don't think many, but there will be some people who look at this and think, well, I've got to do a qualification that's not for me, and decide to leave. That you know that that happens. So you know we shouldn't, uh, to, you know, we shouldn't be blasé about that. But that that will happen because that yeah. happens all the time in, in in any job. You know, you have restructures within organisations, and people find that their job roles changed, um, and actually their new role isn't really what they want to do, um, and they find something else or they leave. And and we can't get away from the fact there will be an element of that. But, but, you know, overall, um, I think people will, will do what they generally do when, when you know, the scope of a, of a role that they do changes or, or when there's an opportunity to develop their, uh, their, their role or their career, they'll, they'll do what, what is needed to, to be done. I completely, completely agree. One of the things I liked, I say liked, but I was in favour of at the moment, I hope will stick through. And it does tie into the next point in the chat, which was from Joe Leckie, which is that, there wasn't anything in the in the legislation saying you had to be qualified to get the job. So you didn't have to say you were going to go into head of service. You didn't need to be qualified to get to that, which is the problem. We've had so much in social care, I've recruited across housing and social care, as I say, for over a decade now. And trying to recruit registered managers is the bane of so many businesses life because you have to be level five qualified, although there's some legislative change. And people haven't got qualified but can't get qualified because they're not getting the job and we're stuck in this cycle and that doesn't seem to be the case within housing I guess my concern has always been if you have two candidates who one seems slightly better than the other but only outscores by two or three points and is qualified uh, so the qualified candidate is maybe uh, not as strong but it's going to be easier our business is going to lean towards someone who isn't qualified sorry who is qualified but maybe not as strong because it's easier for the business as a whole and it ties in a little bit into what Joe's point, which is that two years isn't very long for a transition. It's going to be very onerous for providers, bearing in mind we know how they're currently finding it hard at the moment. Let's not get away from the fact that housing is not an easy job to be in currently. So her worry is that L&D for other levels of staff will suffer 
during that transition as budgets are, re are reconfigured to cover the costs. And so when we're looking at budgets and when we're looking at training, do we think that L&D might get hit by this? And do we think that businesses might be forced in a way, almost subconsciously, to take a, a different route from recruitment, even though it's not specified, you have to be qualified to get the job. You may end up going down that route because it'll be easier for the business. Um, yeah, I think some organisations may choose to, to do that. I think that would be quite short term thinking. I'm sure we've all recruited at times and, and got things wrong and are conscious of the impact that that has on the people involved on the on the wider organisation, too. So I would like to think that people will always look to recruit the best person for the for the job rather than the, the person that is, is most convenient. Um, I think we can all cite examples of where we've got recruitment wrong, and uh, and it's not an easy process to to get out uh, to get out of. So, I, I would I wouldn't like you know I would hope that, that as a sector we're we're, we're better than that really. Um, really valid point around cost pressures. You know this this will be an additional burden um, at a time where capacity in the sector is is pretty strained, um, and organisations I guess will have to make decisions around. Uh, L and D budgets and how they how they allocate them. It, it, I suppose my my it, you know my experience in the sector shows me that the organisations will always take different views on where they prioritise spending and the, the particular emphasis they place on on L and D. I, I think the really good organisations, you know, in my experience, always find a way to be able to prioritise L and D in a way that that benefits the people that work within their organisation. And I'd actually like to hope that L&D will be something that arguably becomes more important, not less, when something like this comes in because of the need, as we've talked about, for that for that continual uh, professional development as it goes through. Um, Yvonne Davies, I don't know if you're still with us. I know you dropped me a message. Uh, do please come in. Thanks, Matt. Um, I don't want to hijack the conversation in a different direction because I know obviously people are really are very keen to talk about the qualifications. Um, I just wanted to say that obviously social housing stigma is 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 a big issue uh, for residents. And um, with that in mind, there's a project partnership um, of Durham and Sheffield University, TPAS, CIH, and the tenant volunteers of the Stop Social Housing Stigma campaign that I'm involved with. Um, stigma is included in the new conduct and competency standard as one of the things uh, which, uh, which I guess the training uh, around respect and all of the other matters, um, which the softer stuff perhaps than than the qualifications is concerned. Um, the project will really kick start next week when a survey will come out for tenants, housing professionals contractors and suppliers and anyone else like uh, consultants etc who are interested in the sector I just wanted to give it a flag now um, uh, but it's something that we've been working on probably for the last 18 months and beyond that really back to when CIH uh, wrote the it's not okay guide with the stop social housing stigma tenants group at least about six years ago really so um, I'm sure James will tell me when, but I can't remember. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to flag the, that and, and you know, the offer is there if you want us to come and explain that and what, what, what perhaps some of the softer skills might be in terms of unconscious bias, really, um, on stigma and how that's promoted. Uh, Thank it's, you, Yvonne. I think it's important. Sorry, James, do come in. <laughs> But it certainly goes to the heart of, I think, perhaps what the Better Social Housing Review and... Um, and there's consultation, isn't it? Just the qualifications, it's it. conduct and competency as a whole, isn't it? So, Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Please fill it in. <laughs> um, that, yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Great point. And in a way, that's, that's, that kind of brings us back to, to where we started. It, Generally, in any sect, whatever the sector is, if if in a regulated sector there is a decision made by the regulator or by government to introduce another layer of regulation, that generally means that there is something that sector has been failing to do, uh, or or there is an area where that's where they where that sector could do better. And that brings us back to the to the starting point here, isn't it? Which is, 
you know, how, how, however positive we are about the sector, it's very clear that there are things that we have been getting wrong and things that we haven't been doing at a sectoral level as well as we should have been. That's why we're in the position that we're in. Um, but I don't want to finish on a negative because I think there is, through this, this process, there is a real opportunity here by us embracing this focus on professionalism to be able to bring about the kind of changes that that we think we need to make, you know, as housing professionals. Um, and ultimately, you know, the people that should benefit as a result of this are the people that live in social housing. And I think ultimately that's why we do the job. It certainly is. I'm going to... Re re race through two or three points in literally a 10 second answer so hopefully we can get some so what is the time scale for modules experience because we need to get started i'm concerned if we don't register senior staff on the full quality commercial cost we won't be compliant but if we, if we wait to see what the outcome of the decisions are we might also might not be deemed compliant what would you advise that's from michelle fake yes and that's that. thank you so um so michelle i mean Qualification market is a commercial is a commercial market. So whatever route there is, there will be a cost attached to it. So I think if you've got people that, as I say, if you've got people that you think are in scope, then they should you should think about signing up for the qualification now. If there are if there are other options available, then there will still be that cost. There won't be anything that's available that doesn't have a cost attached to it. Uh, question from Neil Goodrich. What's the consideration here between the code of conduct element of these changes and broader HR management within organisations? Conceivably, there would need to be an alignment between the two. And that's followed up by Nick saying we already have a corporate code of conduct and are scraping our head about how to amend it to fall in line with requirements. What do we do with the person who flatly refuses to do a qualification? And Debbie says code of conduct, appraisals, performance manager, all of this has to link. And I think that'd be a really interesting arena over how we're going to manage people who just either point blank refuse or, or don't wish to get involved. Um, yeah. Go on, sorry. That's a conversation with the regulator again, isn't it? I think because the regulator is going to be monitoring this. So if you've got people in that situation, then that's the conversation about how you're going to um, compensate for that or, or deal with that situation. That's definitely something that, again, we're hoping to see a bit more clarity as this continues through. Uh, Jane has said, what body will hold ultimate responsibility for deciding what qualifications meet the requirements? That will be the regulator, I'm assuming. Um, uh, Nikki, will the level four in managing housing maintenance cover the requirements? We are looking at it at the moment because we have, as I say, just we've got the criteria for the last couple of weeks. So um, I can't categorically say that yet, but we will have information out on that very, very shortly. Ashley Jones, how are CIH preparing for the extra volume of qualifications that will need to be delivered? I know you're not the only ones delivering. I know like you're the main body in terms of it's, it's developed from there's eight or nine providers that deliver your thing. But I know everyone's trying to hire. This is a this is a potential problem, isn't it? It is. It is. Absolutely. We have been gearing up over the last few months with the, seeing this in, coming down the track. So we have improved our IT systems. We have brought in additional changed our sort of model in terms of tutors and assessors. That's going to be an area that's key for it across the board in terms of having people that have housing and assessment experience. If anybody wants to get in, involved in, in uh, teaching and training and housing qualifications, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Um, but and we've 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 sort of ad added in additional programs, etc. We've got a number of different ways that we offer the qualification. There's a lot of flexibility there from a CIH point of view. But Matt, as you rightly say, we are also awarding organisation developing the qualifications, and there are a network of other training providers across the across the country that also offer this. So we'll have their own offer as well, and we'll be going through a very similar process to this particular. You know, we know exactly what the requirements are looking like they're going to be. And I'm sure it'll be, you know, very easy to kind of contact yourselves and go, what's your capacity? And then and then diversify. I think it's where, you know, the, this unified working is going to be key over the next year. A few more points have come in regarding the L&D element. I think we're going to be learning all the time. You know, I think there's going to be lots that will follow on from this. Um, but I just want to say a massive thank you to Sarah and James for bringing a really complicated topic to, and, and quite contentious topic, I think, to 100 people in under an hour is pretty good going. Um, I think we've had lots of food for thought. I think there's lots more that are always going to be dive, you know, dive deep, deep dived into. Um, but Sarah, James, any last minute comments you'd like to make before we wrap up today's session? 
from me just a big thank you for for getting involved and for your views and your questions that's really really helpful and a figure we'll send i will send around the slides but if i can urge you to respond to our survey and also respond directly to the consultation that would be brilliant thank you james yeah i think so so i've said everything that i was going to say big thank you to all of you and uh, do get in touch if you want to discuss further fantastic do reach out do get involved with the consultation it's always the way that we have lots of discussion on these topics and then the consultation numbers sometimes are lower than expected so do please have your input share your views shape the future of what comes next but for now if you'd like to get involved in future social housing roundtables do reach out to me but a massive thank you to the cih for today and i look forward to seeing you all at a future event thanks very much all cheers matt